chapter 15. I'm looking forward to getting past Job 15. This last section that we've been looking at. Um, let's see, what was the, how many verses did it actually run? Was it 23? Verse 23? No, verse 20. Verse 20 to the end of the chapter, we're uh, seeing this is uh, um, about the Antichrist because he calls him the wicked. Uh, verse 20 there, he calls him, let me get over here to the right verse. He says, The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. And we know what Job's three friends are doing. They're looking at Job when they're saying this. But we know that prophetically what it applies to. It applies to someone that's coming that is very, very wicked. Um, you know, we, we talk about the, uh, the devil incarnate. Well, that's who's going to show up, eventually going to show up on this earth, at least for the last three and a half years of the, if you want to call it the tribulation period, called the Great Tribulation. Uh, the devil himself will be here. And he's going to present himself through this man called the Antichrist. And there's going to be some wickedness. And the last verse we left off on was verse 28. Lord willing, we can get to the end of the uh, chapter here. But I want to reread verse 28 for you. It says, He dwelleth in desolate cities, in houses which no man inhabiteth, which are ready to become heaps. And there's, there, he, he is called, we looked at Matthew, um, Matthew, it's coming to me. Well, now, now it's no longer there. 24, 13. Well, when the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stands in the holy place. Hmm? 24, 15. Thank you. And, but notice it says, the abomination that maketh desolate. Through uh, the ministry of this man and through the things he's going to set up on this earth, he's going to bring a desolation down upon mankind. That's nothing to be compared to it. Uh, look at Revelation chapter 18. Specifically, the Bible speaks of this desolation. Revelation 18. Look at verse 16 to 19. And saying, Alas, alas, for that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls... For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company in ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the burn or the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, and weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in, uh, in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. See that? That's the seat of the beast. And I've, I think I've explained that a few times before, or at least tried to explain it, that the Antichrist begins in one place only to want to wind up in another and then he destroys the original place. Now, this is not uncommon. Um, uh, politicians or uh, revolutionaries that overthrow nations, they, they use people to do that. You know, people come in, they're violent, they're vulgar, they're vile, they murder, they pillage, they rape, and they overtake a nation. Well, you can't have those kind of people backing you up. So the revolutionaries, once they get done with taking over a place, then they kill the people that, Helped him do it. Uh, in this case, the Satan, his seat, where his seat actually is, which is Rome, that's where his seat is. That's where he begins. But he doesn't want to be in Rome. He doesn't care anything about Rome. He doesn't care anything about his seat. He wants God's seat, which is over in Jerusalem, in the most holy place, uh, called the mercy seat. He wants to sit on that seat because that seat is for God. So he's got to get from here to there. He doesn't care how he does it. He doesn't care who he has to destroy to do it. Even if he has to destroy this seat. And you say, well, why would he destroy this seat when he gets this seat? Because now you have two seats of authority. And the Bible says, can 
the Bible says that if uh, Satan be divided against Satan, how shall his kingdom stand? You can't have this seat over here saying we're the authority. You know, Rome's always said they're, you know, they're vicar and they're the authority on this earth. And have this seat over here, the Jewish seat, saying this is the authority. So you know what he does? He has those ten kings, those ten nations that are supporting him nuke this seat right here. I mean, if you read it, it's a nu- you can tell it's a nuclear um, uh, attack. And it says the, they, 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 they're watching from ships as this place burns. And they can't even go in. They says talks about the gold being cankered and the silver. Everything, everything's just, it's just wiped out. And they can't even walk in there and, and uh, all their, uh, I guess this would be like a major shipping lane. And all of it's just wiped out. But that desolation comes because of him. And it says, He dwelleth in desolate cities and in houses which no man inhabiteth, which are ready to become heaps. And then in verse 29, it says, He shall not be rich, neither shall his substance continue, neither shall he prolong the perfection thereof upon the earth. Well, again, uh, when Eliaphaz is saying this, I think he's looking at Job. He shall not be rich. His substance uh, shall not continue, neither shall he prolong the perfection thereof upon the earth. What is he saying? He's saying, well, Job, you're not going to be able to keep this little perfection that God's given you. He's going to take it away from you. In fact, he has taken it away from you. Now, that's ultimately true of all wicked men in that their riches are only temporary. But that's true of everybody, wicked or not. Um, The riches you have in this earth, they're only temporary. You can't take them with you. Ecclesiastes 5.15. Ecclesiastes 5.15 says, As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he, re- uh, shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away, by, uh, carry away in his hand. In other words, the old saying, you can't take it with you. That's where it came from. It came from a King James Bible. You can't take it with you. I know people that bury stuff with folks. I don't care. Bury it with them, but I don't know why. I mean, you know. If I got one good suit, give it to somebody else that could wear it and put something on me that's, you know, you'd throw away in the trash or, you know, use as a, a rag in the garage to wipe up grease stains or something. I don't know. But uh, folks put stuff in there. I don't know why they do that. They can't take it with them. And probably before they ever get buried, uh, some caretaker uh, lifts it out of there anyway. I don't know. Maybe they leave it in there. So I, <clears throat> when they dig me up, I want to be just as poor as I live. Don't put nothing, nothing in there valuable. <laughs> anyway, um, so Eliaphaz uh, throws a barbed dart at Job with, with this statement, uh, implying that God relieved him of all the precious things that he had and his riches and destroyed his perfect little kingdom he had going. And um, I'm sure that, you know, Job is looking, looking real mean at him as, Eliphaz is insinuating that when all along this thing applies to someone much, well, make Job look little compared to the wickedness this guy is. Um, the devil's kingdom, though, if you think about it, is going to be very short lived. Revelation uh, 17 12 says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. And these are going to be a, a ten king confederacy. It says, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Um, We're down to a matter of a few years that this whole thing, this whole world system winds up. That's not a long time. I mean, even a a president, even Joe Biden is supposed to get four years. He won't make it, but Kamala gets four years. (laughs) Um, But here it says one hour with the beast. So it's a, it's a, it's a short-lived period of time. Um, the devil will, uh, how long he'll be able to sit in that seat? Not too long. Uh, Psalm 52, verse 3 to 7 says, Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness, Selah. Thou lovest all the devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy, uh, destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. It says, The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that, God, that, that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Talk about that Antichrist. 
God will take him away, take him away in an hour. I mean, over within an hour. Boom. Gone. Forever. So, what the devil's got coming is, yes, he wants to bring this kingdom about, and yes, it's going to be there for just a little while, but not very long. Not going to last very long at all. In verse 30, he says, He shall not depart out of darkness. The flame shall dry up his branches, and by the breath of his mouth shall he go away. Um, we already mentioned this about when the Antichrist uh, is thrown into the lake of fire, he doesn't ever get out. Now, the devil does get out of the bottomless pit. We see that. We see that Judas does get out of the bottomless pit uh, to go into perdition, you know, the Antichrist. But when the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 10, they, they never get out. Uh, and there's, you say, how can there be darkness in a lake of fire? It says, he shall not depart out of the darkness. Well, um, if you even look at the consistency of what's in that lake, I'm talking about the Dead Sea, the lowest place on earth, 1,300 feet below sea level. And that uh, area there is full of what we call bitumen. It's tar. Um, it's, a, uh, it's like an asphalt type of um, compound, and it just layers the bottom of that lake. Uh, also, sulfur is in that lake in abundance. It used to be that there'd be big clumps of it. I mean, it's like small islands floating around of this, uh, this brimstone. And it's been known to light on fire. I even found that one in a, uh, an encyclopedia that talked about that area, that it used to light, light on fire. That lake would light on fire through lightning or something like that. It is so salty. It's nine times saltier than the Atlantic. You, can't, you cannot submerge in it. You just float. So they go there for their baths and, you know, to get their, their mud <laughs> facials and everything. I'm not floating in that thing. Somebody might light a match. Uh, but you say, what is that? That's going to be the lake of fire on this earth. And when all that bitumen comes up and starts floating, I mean, you can imagine, set that thing on fire. Uh, it's going to be a burning lake of fire. And it says in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil that deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. A thousand years after the Antichrist is thrown in, the devil's thrown in. But it says the beast and the false prophet are there. Not was there, are there. So they're in this thing for a thousand years before the devil shows up. Um, look at, uh, notice he says there, he shall not depart out of darkness. The flame shall dry up his branches. And this is that thing where the Bible does this thing and, and compares something to something else. And here, he's, uh, the Antichrist is being likened into a tree. Now let's look at Ezekiel chapter 31. And um, Ezekiel chapter 31... Look at verse 2 to 9. It says, Son of man, speaketh to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is a type of the Antichrist. And to his multitude, whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold the Assyrian, another title for the Antichrist. Behold the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches. We know a cedar is a pretty tall tree. And with uh, a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Uh, it says, the waters made him great, the deep set him up on high with her rivers running around about his plants and set out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied. Am I saying that right? The boughs of a tree? B-O-U-G-H-S? For some reason I don't think I'm saying it right. I'm saying it right? Okay. This doesn't sound right. Um... And his boughs were multiplied, his, his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. Notice this, all the fowls of heaven made their nest in his boughs. And under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young. And under his shadow dwelt all great nations. You'll find a reference to Rome where all the a cage of every foul bird uh, mentioned over there. And it's talking about every foul spirit too. So it's not only F-O-W-L, but it's F-O-U-L, foul. 
thus was he great, thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God cannot hide him. What tree do you think we're talking about now? What tree couldn't they hide in the Garden of Eden? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The fir trees were not like his boughs, the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. You, you go read about Lucifer and see what it says about him. He said he was perfect in beauty. Over in Ezekiel 28. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. If you, wanted, you know what? If you wanted to deceive someone, just make it look good. You know, uh, fruit, um, fruit, uh, or oh, how's it go? It's not only good for fruit, but also to make one wise. It had to be pleasant looking. That's how the devil presents everything in this life. Uh, he'll deceive you by making it look like pleasant, something that you would want, something you think would even help you. That's how it's presented. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he has shot up his top among the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up uh, in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen, he shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And I don't have any idea who he's talking about there uh, when he mentions the, the mighty one of the heathen. I don't know who he's referring to there. It could be a reference to Jesus Christ, but it kind of you know, the heathen. It may have a, uh, a historical reference um, to, someone that, that, so to somebody that overtook uh, Pharaoh, king of Egypt at the time. It could be the Assyrian, too. Um, also look at Ezekiel 15. Turn back a few chapters. Now, I don't understand everything about this, these trees and everything. There's a lot of, a lot of your Bible is like that. And it's almost poetic in the way that it's presented. Um, <clears throat> and the Lord knows I'm the worst of the poets here, even understanding them. But in, in Ezekiel 15, uh, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree or than a branch, which is among the trees of the forest? And he goes down through there. And if you look down through there, he talks about this vine tree. Well, what you have is in the Garden of Eden... The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not, I repeat, was not an apple tree. It, it was, in fact, a vine tree. Because it's always in reference to that grape. And it's mentioned many times that grape that was on there was poison. Uh, it was uh, wickedness. It was, it was uh, evil. But it never talks about any apple being like that. It just talks about that vine tree. Uh, you, you notice the vine tree, it's, it's, it, it's just crooked. It grows everywhere. It climbs up other trees, you know. And you've seen them. You're, I've, I've, I've had them this thick around, you know, just growing up another tree and strangling the other tree. But that's what it was, was a vine tree. Um, in Mark chapter 8, verse 24, because I'm not going to read all that. Um, he said he'd given that vine tree for, for fire for fuel. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any reason to go ahead and read all that. Turn to um, Mark chapter 8. In verse 24, notice this. This is when a fellow, a blind man was getting his sight restored. And it says he took the blind man by the hand, verse 23, and led him out of the town... And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. Lord just does everything a different way each time. <laughs> I think that's to throw Benny Hinn off. <laughs> um, I'm surprised they haven't been spitting on people on stage <laughs> just because they read it in the Bible. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Well, you know, your Bible doesn't just record stuff like that for nothing. Uh, it's liking these, these kings or these pharaoh and uh, the Antichrist are likened unto trees. And he said, I see men as trees walking. So study trees. If he tells you it's a vine tree, study a vine tree. You'll learn more about the Antichrist by studying a vine tree. Um, 
if I don't know what he would like in Jesus Christ too. I mean, he was crucified on an oak. Now, if they try to say it's a dogwood, it's an oak, <laughs> not a dogwood tree from the scriptures. Anyway, and I can't prove that tonight. I, I just know that it's so. I just don't know the verse. Uh, he mentions there in verse 30, by the breath of his mouth shall he go away. Now, you know, English is not my first language. It is my only language. <laughs> um, you'll get that in a minute. I, I don't even know English is what I'm trying to tell you. But this, we're jumping back and forth of uh, who's the antecedent to the, um, when it says the breath of his mouth. Well, whose mouth? Because in the context, you have this wicked one, and then you have, uh, you have God. Uh, I think it mentions the mighty God in the context. So, if it's, the, if it's the breath of his mouth shall he go away, talking about God, then I'll show you some verses on that. If it's the breath of this evil one, I have no idea what it's talking about. None at all. Um, let me get down here where I'm at. Uh, in Isaiah 11, 4. Isaiah 11, 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Okay? That's a reference to the second coming. That's a refer reference to Jesus Christ coming back. And he will slay the wicked with the very breath of his lips. And we saw last week we looked at a verse where it talked about the spirit of his mouth or the, the sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth, in which to smite the nations. That's Revelation 19. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, he says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. He's talking about destroying that wicked, in reference to the Antichrist. So it says he shall not depart out of darkness. Uh, the flame shall dry up his branches. He's going to wind up in hell. And by the breath of his mouth shall he go away. He's done for when the Lord returns. Verse 31, it says, Let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense. This is God's law of sowing and reaping. You trust vanity, you reap vanity. Now what do I mean by vanity? Where vanity or vain is something that's ultimately worthless, pointless, futile. And that's basically what men put their trust in, something that's ultimately... I didn't say it wasn't worth something here and now. If, if you had a big pile of gold here in the floor, it'd be worth something. But it won't be worth nothing in the Day of Judgment. It won't be worth nothing in the, in the time of Great Tribulation or the time when uh, the Lord Jesus Christ returns. It'll be, it will be ultimately worthless, pointless, and futile. But that's what, that's what a fool does. He puts his trust in those things. So if he's deceived to trust in vanity, then vanity shall be what he gets uh, as a recompense. Something vain and useless. Uh, think about this. Turn to Genesis 1-2. Since he's talking about that wicked, let's think about this for a second. All right, you have a being that's created named Lucifer. Uh, he decides that uh, he wants more. Uh, he's got a little real estate under his feet, and uh, he's looking at this world, and he's got it looking pretty good. He's got some cities built up, you know. He's got some precious stone. He's got some, I mean, this guy's decked out. He looks good. He sounds good. He's perfect in beauty. You know, and he's thinking, man, <laughs> you know, I might as well be sitting in the throne with God because nobody's ever done anything this great before. And so he's just thinking about that, you know, and, and he decides that, uh, well, right down in his heart, this, this voice says, I will ascend. I will exalt. I will be like the Most High. And he says, five I wills. I can't think of all of them. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 or 13? 14. Isaiah 14 says, five I wills. And at that point, he, it's, like a, it's like a coup. He thinks, he says, I will be like the Most High. He's a created being. That's, 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 all, that's pretty uh, brave. Pretty arrogant, actually. If, you're a, if, the, if the being that created you, you think, I'm going to be like him. 
like being on like an equal basis, like we'll share the throne together. Well, God heard that. He said, thou shalt be brought down to hell the sides of the pit. But notice Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Enter Satan, or Lucifer, his fall. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. You say, what is that? That's, va that's what vanity gets you. That's what he looked at and saw. He saw all that God had created and what he had made of it. He saw that real estate, and that's all he's about is real estate. And he became vain in his imagination, and then he said in his heart. And you know what he reaped? He reaped vanity. God said, you want it? Throw it under the water. So there it is. There's your world. He reaped the vanity. It became vain and useless. It's going to happen again. Except the Lord's not going to completely destroy this planet. In fact, we're going to live here for, we're going to come back down here and live for another thousand years. But let me tell you something. The verse over there in Jeremiah that talks about this same thing is talking about that tribulation period, that great tribulation where it's going to be a desolation worldwide. There's going to be a lot of rebuilding going on. And it's going to be a wonderful uh, a thousand years, don't get me wrong, but if you think this world, the, the, the people of this world that survive it, if you think they're not going to be busy, they're going to be busy rebuilding everything on this planet. And the Lord's going to give them the, the, the know-how, the power, the ability to do it. He's going to heal some things. He's going to heal the waters. He's going to heal the lands. If there's, if there's uh, radioactive decay, He'll take care of all that. He can take care of all that. I mean, it won't, it won't be the new heaven and new earth, but it'll be the closest thing to it. It will be everything that science is trying to get to right now, but can't. That's why they, they're, they're trying to control you into you know, what you put in the atmosphere and this and that. And they're just crazy. Actually, they're crazy with it. Uh, I believe in conservation. I believe, I believe in managing this planet. I don't believe in dumping stuff. I don't. I mean, you'd be stupid to believe that. They might dump it in your backyard. But there's a, there's a difference between, uh, between that and become heretical that this is all there is. And we can't, we, we've got to, if we have to liquidate half the planet, I mean, you know, Bill Gates and I don't know what he wants to do. They're saying he wants to reduce the population to only like 300 million. Well, that means seven, seven and a half billion, billion of you have to go. Good grief, that's not an answer. Trusting in science over the Lord is an example of trusting vanity. Science cannot help you with the problem that is killing you. And that's killing this planet. You know what it is? It's sin. That's what's killing you and that's what's killing this planet. So they don't have any answers. Um, they think they do. All right. Um, verse 32. It shall be accomplished before his time and his branch shall not be green. Now there I got some question marks about what does it mean by his time. It shall be accomplished. What? This reaping this vanity or uh, the end of this thing? It shall be accomplished. Well, let's say that it is talking about the end. When the, when the Antichrist shows up and nobody knows he's the Antichrist, he is, he's wonderful. Um, you couldn't say enough good things about him. Uh, he's all for mankind, you know, and loving one another and singing Kumbaya and all that stuff. But Daniel 9.27 gives us a little hint of what, may, what this may refer to. And like I said, I can't, I can't say 100% that this is what it is. But it says, It shall be accomplished before his time, and his branch shall not be green. In other words, it's like he never achieves what he actually wants to achieve before the end comes. And it says in Daniel 9.27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now we know that's seven years. One week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And what he does is, in the, 
he, he confirms the covenant. I think it's the Mosaic covenant he confirms. But he confirms this covenant. It's kind of like making a covenant with Israel for seven years. In the midst of those seven years, he stops what we call the daily sacrifices. If these ever start up, we're leaving. If we even hear they're going to start up, that we're leaving. Because the thing starts from those daily sacrifices beginning again. And what they were was the sacrifices that the Old Testament called for that Jew to make every day. They do not need a temple to do it. All they need is an altar. That's all they need is to set up an altar to make those daily sacrifices. So uh, when he begins to... Um, those sacrifices will go along and in the middle of the week, okay, in the middle of the week, he will stop those sacrifices. And that's when things start getting really strange. Uh, what ends up getting sacrificed on that altar is anything that's, that God considers abominable. There's a reference in Isaiah 65, 6, somewhere in there, where it talks about a dog's head or a pig or a man. And what ends up happening is that they end up offering the saints on that altar in Jerusalem. And they're, they're killed by the thousands. In fact, the, uh, Revelation talks about them, talks about their souls are underneath the altar. And they're killing these saints and they're drinking their blood. Now, you, you say, that's too far-fetched, I can't believe that. Well, uh, you'd be surprised what men degrade to. Um, they, may be, may, they may even go so far as to have um, cannibalism. For one thing, you've got to remember that God is also plaguing this earth and there's a drought going on that's going to last three and a half years. Now, you can get pretty hungry with a, good, with a drought like that worldwide. But anyway, he causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations. This is when also he takes and puts in the, in the temple, he puts a... Um, what we call the holy place where the furniture is, he puts an image of himself. And this image is somehow, whether it be supernaturally or scientifically, I don't, don't know, but it can talk. It can, it can compel people to take the mark of the beast. And you know it as the internet that knows every move you make and everywhere you go and where you shop and what you buy, what your habits are. And if everything's tied into that, you can't buy or sell unless you have that mark, either in your, your right hand or your forehead. So all this is going on, and you'd think he'd get to the end of this seven years, but he doesn't. Because except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. That thing doesn't last seven years. If I understand my Bible right, according to... Daniel chapter 8, it lasts 2,300 days, which is 6.38 years, not 7. So even though he, in the midst of the week, he stops the sacrifices, he never does fulfill that seven-year covenant. It never, it never does come to fruition. And I think that's the point where he's on the throne and everybody's accepting him as God. Well, the Jews don't. They know immediately when he sets up that temple in the, in the holy place that they've been hoodwinked. They've been deceived. A Jew knows not to worship an idol. So does a Muslim. So there's two groups right there that aren't going to be too happy that there is a, uh, an idol in the holy place. And it's dictating to them how they live. I think that Muslim is going to be the sorriest of all. He's going to realize that he... he his own, he's actually related. I mean, Ishmael, that's where you, you get your Arabs and you get your, mainly your Muslims there. Uh, Ishmael's related. That's, that's Abraham's, one of Abraham's sons. And yet they got it all wrong. But they're not going to be like the rest of the planet, believes in a multiplicity of gods and, and don't have no problem with idols. A Muslim has a problem with idols and so does a Jew. In Luke 23, 31... I just threw this verse in. We talk about trees and things. It says, His branch shall not be green. It's never going to be fruit-bearing. The Bible says, By their fruit ye shall know them. 
This thing's never going to work out. It's, he's going to work for it. He's going to strive for it, but he's just never going to accomplish it completely. In fact, what you find out is, even when he thinks he's got the whole world in his grasp, he hears rumors that there's problems in his kingdom. <laughs> you betcha. God will make sure he's got problems. But that verse over there in Luke 23, 31, uh, Jesus Christ is on his way to Calvary. And some women are weeping for him. He said, weep not for me. He says, for if, they have, for if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Now, at first you read that, you think, that means nothing to me. <laughs> and that's, it, it didn't mean anything to me for years. And what he's saying is, if while the Son of God is on this planet, the creator of the universe, man, that's a green tree. If while I'm here, they do this, they're going to nail me to a tree, wait till you see it when it's dry. When that dry tree, doesn't he say there? Doesn't he mention there, the flame shall dry up his branches? You wait till that tree's here. You wait till that old vine tree shows up. I mean, if they can crucify the Creator, if they can hang him on a tree naked, pull out his beard and spit on him, what do you think is going to happen when the dry tree shows up? When that old vine shows up? Man, it'll be something. Now, if you apply that historically... He said, you know, if this is done at a green tree while I'm here, wait till I'm gone. And within 40 years of his crucifixion, uh, Titus and his armies, or Titus and his uh, legions came in there. And those Jews held them off for as long as they could, but they crucified 500 a day outside the walls. And there, you couldn't find a tree within like, I don't know how many miles it was. It was 30, 40, 50 miles of the place. Couldn't find a tree. They were crucifying them, and they were lighting them on fire at night as uh, lanterns. This really happened. You had the 8th and the 10th legion stay behind and dig that place up to the, the foundations. They dug that entire city up. And um, when he sees them women weeping for him, he says, Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. What they had coming up, they had no idea. So... It'll be accomplished for his time. i got to move on here. Verse 33. It says, He shall shake off his unripe grape as the vine and shall cast off his flower as the olive. And the takeaway is that nothing that the Antichrist does will come to fruition. Um, the grape will, uh, will, will get shaken off before it's ripe. And uh, the flower of the olive, well, if you, know, if you lose your flower, uh, this, happens, this happens nearly every year to our cherry trees. You know, all of a sudden we look out there and all these blossoms and everything, you know, and you'll see, start to see just a few little uh, uh, bees buzzing around it. And then the, the next day you get a really heavy rain or you get sleet or something like that or a freeze. Next thing you know, all the blossoms fall off and nary a cherry on that tree. And that's what he's saying here, that, 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 that cast off the flower of the olive. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't yield. Now, it, the, the fact that he mentions... Grapes and olives is kind of interesting. The grapes are mentioned. If look at turn to Deuteronomy 32. Remember, I told you that tree in the garden is a vine tree, and vine trees put out grapes. 32, 32. He says, "For their vine is the vine of Sodom." And of the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asp. It's interesting, though, when we have the, uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, we, we have something that is a representation of His blood, and we call it it's grape juice. The Bible talks about the pure blood of the grape, okay? But yet you go to some other church and what you've got is great. You've got a juice that's not pure, that's leavened. And they've got a different, they got a different grape, they got a different vine. And he says that thing is the poison, the poison of dragons and cruel venom of asp. Makes me wonder if that tree in the garden, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil didn't have poison fruit on it because it poisoned mankind. So... Then he mentions the olive. So he got the grapes, 
And then you got the olive. And the only thing I can think of, and Dr. Ruckman may mention of it, is in Ezekiel 28, 14, it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now that word anointed there, uh, Mashiach, it's another word for a king or a Christ. And he's referred to as both. Remember, the Bible talks about the Lord's Christ, but you've got to worry about the devil's Christ. They are two. So somebody just using the terminology Christ all the time, it's like, which one are you talking about? Because one of them is this guy right here, the anointed cherub that covereth. And they anoint, when you anoint someone in the Bible, you anoint them with olive oil. It's the, it's the anointing um, stuff, I guess. Let me give you a, a verse here in Deuteronomy 28, 40. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast, but thou shalt not... Now, this is talking about a judgment against them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast, and thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for, thy, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. This is exactly what the verse says up here. In other words, they're full of olive trees, and they're for anointing, but he's not going to allow Israel to have that, that olive because it's not going to, it's not going to fruit. It's, not going to, it's going to cast its fruit. Um, the other thing is there, when you have something anointed, if God anoints something, he's chosen it, right? And I thought of this verse, and I thought, what am I going to do with that? The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Well, if you think about it, God still makes him a king, doesn't he? The Bible says he's king of over all the children of pride. The Bible says he's the king over the bottomless pit. He's the prince of the power of the air. So God didn't change his mind about making him a king and a prince. His calling was not in vain. He said, oh, I'm going to use you all right. And he didn't make him fall. He fell on his own. Uh, verse 34. Y'all looking at me like, what in the world is he talking about tonight? I'm doing my best. Verse 34. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate, and fire shall consume the tabernacles of robbery or bribery. Congregation of hypocrites. Well, if we wanted to apply that to today, it would be the corrupt mainstream media. The left, if you applied, I mean, if you applied it, it, it would refer to the left today. Why? They bribe, blackmail, batter, bloviate, hypocrisy 24-7. We have seen it day in and day out for a year or more. No, we've seen it day in and day out for four years of how crooked they can be. And they are a congregation of hypocrites. Do you know when I started running hypocrites, or hypocrite, I didn't run hypocrisy, but I ran hypocrite. Do you know the first, first mentions of the word hypocrite and hypocrites, plural, are in Job. First mention in the Bible is in the book of Job. Job 8.13, Job 15.34. And that is hypocrite and hypocrites. And then the first six uses of the word hypocrite are in Job. 8, 13, 13, 16, 17, 8, 20, verse 5, 27, verse 8, 34, verse 30. You can look it up in any uh, online search engine. Um, the word hypocrites in Job is found twice. It's only found three times in the Old Testament. Two of those are in Job. Job 15, 34, and 36, 13. The only other time it's used is Isaiah 33, 14. Now, here's what I found interesting. I looked at it throughout the whole Bible. And it's found a few times, 14 times in Matthew, once in Mark, twice in Luke. Not anywhere beyond the Gospels. And every single time in the Bible, it referenced those Jews. Because you've got to be a believer to be a hypocrite. You've got to believe something. There's got to be something you believe, that, and, and then what your actions do that make you hypocritical. And every reference I found, I mean, you could, you could probably take, I think there might have been one in Proverbs or something. You could have made a general application of that one. But even then, he's referring to his people of being hypocrites. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate, and fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. That's what we call corruption. Um... It's used today, and it'll be used till, uh, till the Lord comes, of uh, people being bribed, judges being bribed. The wickedness that goes on 
I don't think we can even fathom. I think, I think we'd just rather shut down and not look at it because you can't stop it. Okay? You can cry out against it. You can, you can voice your opinion about it, but we can't stop that thing. But it is overwhelming. When the Lord gets back, you can't even imagine everything being... You know, you could go before a judge and actually get a righteous judgment. You know, God put judges in the gates. I've never understood it. I never understood a court system that I could never afford to go to. I've never understood that a day in my life. Why can't I just go before a judge without him saying, well, you've got to pay this fee and that fee and, you know, where's your, where's your lawyer at? And Why? Why can't I just go before a judge and say, hey, this guy did this. Is that right, Judge? Should, shouldn't he pay for that? Isn't that wrong? And if that judge can make his decision. Should it be a fine one right outside the court sitting on the sidewalk and this judge and you go up, two, two people go up to him and say, you know, we got a little problem here between me and him. He's my neighbor. I'm going to shoot him unless you can, you can make this thing right. But then the judge gives his judgment. You know what? You accept it. You accept the judgment. But why is it only the rich and the people that, that can hire these newfangled lawyers have any chance of getting off? What, what do you mean getting off? They shouldn't get off of anything that they've done wrong. Right? Am I, am I right about that? Okay. And why can't a judge see through all that? So if you're poor, you get convicted because you don't have a good lawyer. But if you got a good lawyer who can, you know, what, grease somebody's palms or, you know, uh, talk to the prosecuting attorney and say, come on, man, let's drop this down to, you know, just um, second degree murder. You know, we know he planned it, but drop it down to second degree. Yeah, <laughs> you must have quit. I remember that fiasco. You're just watching this thing, and you're just thinking, is this how our justice system really works? That you can't see it? I don't know about jurors. I don't know about that. I think if you want real justice, you go before a judge. Forget the jurors. The judge knows the law, and he also knows when, he's, when the wool's getting pulled over his eyes, jurors don't. And a lot of times, they, they, and sometimes they come back, they're just absolutely biased. When somebody can get away with murdering somebody else's child, uh-uh. And don't think God didn't, he, he, when the Lord looks at that kind of thing, and He says, you got blood all over your hands. The whole nation, hold us accountable. Uh, verse 35, and I'll, we'll finish here. They conceive mischief, they bring forth vanity, and their belly prepareth deceit. Now it's almost like it to a pregnancy. <laughs> um, you've got conception there, you've got delivery, and then it looks like, you know, it says, he makes another point about their belly prepareth deceit. In other words, it's coming from the inside. Okay? Um, Proverbs 20, verse 27, and verse 30 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. In other words, the Lord searches inside. Doesn't look on the outside. Okay, You know, you can, you can really not perceive who somebody is by the outside. Their appearance may be deceiving. They may be, uh, they may be one of the kindest people you ever met in your life, but they look scary. I've met a few people like that. I've even met a few people, I was almost afraid to walk up to him like, man, look at that guy. He, he, he looks like he's an axe murderer, you know, and then you go up and meet him, he's one of the kindest people you've ever met in your life. Now, I don't know why they, they put, off that, put off that vibe, but they do. But notice he says there, you see that part it says with the inward parts of the belly? Look at verse 30. The blueness of the wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. You know, I've heard that... <laughs> I've heard Baptist after Baptist get up and say, Now meet your kids till there are stripes on their belly. Come on, man. Come on, man. I'm going to pull Biden on you. Come on, man. 
Look at this context. The context is adults. And the, and the thing that it cleanses is, it cleanses the, it, in other words, it changes the mind of that person. It cleanses away the evil that they're thinking. That's what the, the stripes do. But the stripes aren't on a kid's belly. The stripes are on an adult. The whole context is about adults. Every time you find it in the Bible, where it's talking about stripes, it's talking about whipping an adult. Now y'all don't want to do that, right? <laughs> I was good for my kids, but not for me. I mean, you, you know, okay, I'll give you a, a verse here. It says, judgments are prepared for scorners. This is uh, Proverbs 19.29. This is a chapter before it. Judgment are prepared for scorners and stripes for the backs of fools. Now, I'm thinking we need to bring this back. I'm thinking, uh, you know, a good beating might do some people some good. You know, some par parts of the world, a caning, you know. I remember, remember some little snot-nosed kid got caught doing something. They was going to cane him. They kept negotiating down until they gave him three slaps on the back. But, buddy, when they caned you over there, if you ever seen a cane that's been split open, it's like four knives hitting you in the back, just slicing you. Well, this lashing, they're usually a lashing of, of, of leather strands. And if it was a cat of nine tails, they glued pieces of pottery and glass to it. And then when it grabbed you, they would twist it and turn it. That was Roman, though. We're just talking about lashings. We're talking about getting a beating, being put to stocks and your back whipped. Might do some people some good. I mean, you know, if you ask them, say, okay, we can put you in jail for 10 years on bread and water, or we can give you uh, 39 lashings. I'd have to think that one over. <laughs> I might take the lashings, you know. At least it'll be over with. But you know what? That pain probably do you more good than anything that's ever happened. Um, you remember that Sergeant Army guy? Um, Arlie Army? Arlie he said, uh, he said I could, if I could put my hand on a man for five, five seconds, I could do more for him than six weeks of training. Just five seconds to put my hands on him. That's what, sometimes that's what people need. But he says there's stripes for a back of fools. You know what Isaiah 53, 5 says? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. He took some stripes. Now, he took 39 stripes from one of those cat of nine tails with the glued pottery and glass and ripped him open from stem to stern. Luke 12, 47 says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. That's a scary verse in the Bible, friend. <laughs> That's a scary verse. That knew his Lord's will and didn't do it shall be beaten with many stripes. Now you tell me the Lord don't believe in beatings? Sure he does. He tells you about your children, and you know the context of this. He tells you you beat him with a rod and he, sh and he shall not die. Now he's talking about a switch. He's not talking about harmony organs. That, who would think that? Or scarring this kid for life. Who would think that? I never thought that a day in my life when I disciplined my children. Matter of fact, I, I made sure that that never happened. But the infliction of pain, five seconds of that pain could do for more for them than 20 years of education. In fact, he tells you it will yield forth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. You just got to believe him for it. Everybody thinks, you know, well, I gave him one spank and it didn't work. Well, it's going to take more than one. And it's a process of training and discipline. Training and discipline. You hope you get to the point where your kid never needs the stripes on his back. That's what you want. You want him to get to that point where he'll never, he'll never cause anyone to put stripes on his back because he's misbehaving. Because he's a criminal if he does. Mischief, vanity, deceit starts from within. Everything about this is all... It, Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend, I will exalt, I will be like the most, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. You know, it started inside. He said it in his heart. All this evil starts with an end. He said there in Mark 7, and I'll finish with this, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within 
and defile the man. Everybody's so worried about what's going to defile them. Oh, I don't want to get COVID. It'll defile me. I don't want to get this. It'll, I'm always afraid of what's going in instead of what's coming out. And what's coming out of a man, that defiles a man. Why? All that wickedness. It starts in here and comes out. Now, I know you think that all that wickedness is outside, but it's really not. It's not the cigarettes, not the booze, not the pornography. It all starts in here first. That's where it's at. Okay. Those things just make it blow up what's inside. Okay, anything, anything about what we covered tonight? Another positive lesson.